and this time with a very special guest, uh, Mr. Mark Anzani, who is the vice president, he's a chief strategist for Z Systems at IBM. He's got a fascinating talk today, give you the insights on the strategy and the direction uh, for uh, the Z system. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Mark Anzani. Thank you. So uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for uh, attending here this morning. Uh, for those of you who have not met me before, I, I'm based out of the development lab in uh, Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, for those of you who were in the prior session where Gary was presenting, no, this is not the new British invasion. I know he's English, and I happen to be Welsh originally, although, you know, 30-odd years in the States gives me a slightly aberrated accent. But hopefully you will, uh, you'll get used to that as we go on. Um, the reason I'm over in the, in the States is not, uh, is not that important, but the only piece of advice I'll give you if you send your daughter off on a study abroad program, be careful what she might bring home with her, okay? Because that's how, that's how I came to be here. The, uh, the presentation this morning, I'm gonna chat about a couple of themes, um, but it's really to take some of the things that we see going on in the industry, what our clients are telling us, and translate it down into some of the forces and effects of what it means to us in the design of the platform where are we putting our investments, and what are some of the key initiatives we have underway. In the space of half an hour, you can't cover the entire waterfront of what is going on, obviously, but I do want to hit those key and major ones. And if that's not what you want to hear about, you better leave now, because that's where we're going for, uh, for 30 minutes. Um, the, uh, the themes of mobility and analytics and cloud, um, you know, they're, they're pretty well understood, and obviously, have been talked about at length in, in a variety of, of presentations in this event and all the events that you, that you generally go to. Uh, you know, from a mobility standpoint, the way in which the world is working today, uh, the effects that it has on our needs as technologists and as system designers to be able to satisfy the effects that these workload forces are having on our client environments has in some ways caused us to double down on directions that we have been very strong in for a long period of time, and in other areas have caused us to invest into some new things and bring new technologies to the platform that were really not on our horizon you know, five, six years ago or so. In the case of mobility, just the behavior of the world today, having to access so many of the core data records that tend to be held by a system such as the Z, the way in which those applications are written, oftentimes they're going out and fetching in multiple bytes uh, pieces of information rather than one big effective transactional fetch. That's just the way they are. That drives up workload. The behavior of the individuals using the device. Uh, I've got a high school um, student daughter. She works at a, at a gym as a receptionist and she has babysitting you know, clients and things she does. When she came into that, uh, and starting to get her own bank account. It was during the time of the financial crisis going on, so her view of the stability of banks is not necessarily the same that I might have, and therefore, on her mobile app, she's constantly checking her balance because she has the fear that her babysitting money is gonna bloody disappear, right? So, you know, you have those effects, and that is driving transactions and data fetches and loads to the systems, the core systems, in ways that are far greater than anything we saw with the transition to internet behaviors and certainly the behaviors of before. We have to respond to that. In the case of analytics, the need to get insight from the data that is held on a system has to drive processes that are getting that insight at the time of the data being manipulated and updated. You cannot wait for it to be taken to another platform for analytics to be done there, and that is causing big effects for us. And then cloud, which from the standpoint of delivering shared services and efficient multi-user environments and sharing of data and isolation of data, things that are fundamentals for us on the platform we've been doing so long, what cloud is driving us to do is to you know, get access through improved elements of API management and you know, 
all the technologies we have to drive for that, but also, frankly, commonality of management with other platforms to be able to get uh, consistent orchestration, provisioning, and aspects of that, and that drives things like OpenStack. So those are all forces for us, and as I'd said, some of the things that drive behaviors in a client environment, that drive load in a client environment, some of those things, such as the need for availability, you know, um, the classic reliability elements that you think of at a platform of this type, there are strength, and we continue to drive those forward in, in new ways. There are other aspects of integration, bringing together processes that we would not previously have necessarily considered, and analytics is a very good example of that. It's driven huge amounts of investment in homegrown work, porting work of analytic packages, buying analytics company, investment in hardware to be able to accelerate uh, mathematical processes at the root of analytics more and more. So those are the effects that come out of this back to us. And this picture, these terms, what we're doing, we're not trying to create a system that satisfies every type of workload and every sort of environment. That would be absolutely inappropriate and wrong. What we are trying to do is create more seamlessly integrated, more efficient systems with more different types of processing available in them for that end-to-end -end classic enterprise work that should be on that system because the anchor point of it all is the data, the core assets uh, that run on a business. As a system of record, with bank balances and insurance information and those sorts of things, logistics information for retailers, as a system of record, we're firmly present there in so many enterprises. We have really grown out of that now as well to be able to develop the technologies and processes to create this system of insight that is connecting the mobility connections, more modern connections, cloud-based services, whatever they happen to be, and then connect that through to the system of record and make real-time understanding available for clients as they need it. So what does that mean? What it means in our projections is that as we look back on the past 15 years, where we did things like bring Linux to the platform, where we have over many generations enabled greater performance and capability for workloads such as Java, we have seen a rise from a pure computing performance delivery standpoint at an accelerated pace compared to the more traditional and historical pace that we had seen prior to that. We continue to see healthy growth in the classic ZOS, ZTPF, ZVSE, those environments, but we've, we've seen even more accelerated growth being driven by the integration of applications, other forms of database under the overall Linux banner that is going on. And as we look at those trends, and as we look at the effects of these forces that I described previously, we expect to see even faster growth rates available for that, particularly with some of the investments that we've made that I'm going to describe to you. So that's what we've set about to try to capture with our technologies. And therefore, as we look at uh, the various design elements and, and, and stack elements as we go through. The first thing is to know is we are absolutely committed and see the serious need to continue very heavy investment in unique architecture and unique differentiation there. You know, we've continued to develop our own processor chips for the, for the Z machine as we do power architecture and other parts of IBM and continue to see the, the uniqueness of the architecture, the nuances of what they can do for certain workloads to be a fundamental necessity in combination with x86 for other workloads that are the right fit as we move forward. Therefore, if you look at the roadmaps that I have and the investments we make with the, you know, the various parts of IBM and communications to our partners, those investments, you know, there's another three uh, mainframes beyond the latest one that we have developed that are firmly on the drawing board. What I mean by that is we know our target dates. We're starting to define functionality for them. There are engineers working on real elements that are going to go and be delivered into those systems, some of which will not be out there for, for eight, nine years or so. 
This cadence of delivering a large machine every two to two and a half years is set in our plans and will continue because of the growth elements associated with it. A mid-range system coming about a year after the large one, very typically, all of that cadence is going to continue. Our cadence of operating system deliveries and middleware deliveries are all set. And it's then a question of how do we map in and lay in the function to continue the core aspects of the platform as well as be able to respond to all the effects and forces from these, these newer um, client-related business effects that we have seen before. So very heavily invested in the semiconductors, the microprocessor design, and the systems design. We did, yes, make a business decision from an IBM standpoint to move our manufacturing of silicon chips to a partner, Global Foundries, which was closed. We closed that deal in about uh, June of this year. And the reason for that very simply is Global Foundries, first of all, is investing very heavily in technology and driving that forward. Um, their roadmaps of density support very well the nature of what we needed for our roadmaps. And because they are developing and manufacturing for a large number of users and doing it at scale, we don't have to build our own fabrication facilities anymore, which take literally billions of dollars every time you move generations of silicon. So they're going to manufacture them for us, but we will continue to invest very heavily in the design and the fundamental aspects of device physics that are necessary to support the design elements of what it is that we have going on. Not to get too geeky and uh, too much into the, into the physics of it, because um, we really don't have the time. And the only reason I show chips on charts sometimes is so people don't think I'm actually a salesman. I've actually been mistaken for a salesman before. The, the way you tell an engineer from a salesman is look at their shoes. Because if the guy's shoes look pretty crappy, that's an engineer. And if it's a salesman, you'll be able to see your face in them. So be on your guard, OK? So there we go. So we sh I show the, show the chips here. 22 nanometers is the technology we work with today, right? We're investing very heavily and working with our partners in the creation of more dense chips as we go on because we can't run these chips faster anymore. The physics of heat dissipation and things that go on, the smaller devices, the leakage, means you have to be very careful, which is why cycle time is, is reducing again as, uh, through everybody's roadmaps. But density is a wonderful thing, because the more transistors you have, the more capability you have to design into the hardware, the more functionality and performance you can deliver. So we're working right now with 40 nanometer in our designs in our roadmap. Um, we and our partners have proven the ability to go to 10 nanometer devices compared to the 22 of the day. And in IBM research, we've even fabricated seven nanometer devices. So these are very important points, because based on those schedules, you go out past 10 years or so, and we still have the tools necessary to deliver the hardware functions and platforms to support the software and apps that run. What's also very important from that because we'll have to use a lot of different design te techniques to add performance, you'll see even more synergy in terms of functional exploitation and benefit from hardware assists being used by the middleware from IBM, from our partners as well. Right? And you will see performance delivered through software as well as performance and scale delivered through hardware, where in the past, typically, software would consume more performance and be an issue you have to deal with. More efficient software development is critical to be able to allow the scope and scale of what we have going on. And that works for in the compiler space and the other elements that added on the prior chart uh, to drive us forward. So a lot of investment that's going on there in the fundamentals, a lot of investment in new functionality going into the systems. We'll touch a little bit on that towards the end of the presentation. But it's over a billion dollars a year we've been consistently spending when we look at research and hardware and software. That is continuing out there from a pure Z standpoint, as well as the more general elements for, for technology and, and, and semiconductors, things like that. Another important aspect of what we are doing and an increased focus for us over the past 18 months has been the expansion of efforts in the ecosystem that supports the platform to build upon the successful programs we've had to try to help skills availability and also to be able to help access to resources 
for developers, um, ISVs, and the like. As we looked at those charts of growth expectations for Linux, we knew that we were going to have to put even more effort into the arena to allow more rapid adoption of Linux onto the platform and more availability of access to, for developers to Z machines in non-traditional ways. And there are a number of things listed here that were a part of an announcement we did at LinuxCon on uh, August 17th. And I'll highlight just a, a couple of them. You know, the first one, open access to the developer community cloud. What we're doing with that is going to go online basically at the end of this month, around December 1st, it will actually uh, go online. We're just going through the final steps of security testing and other things that's necessary. We have provided Z13 assets to a couple of universities in the States, and there are other assets that are going to follow to hit for capacity reasons in other areas around the globe, although anyone in the world can access the, these ones I'm talking about. Provided Z13 assets to Marist College, first of all, also Syracuse University. They're hosting for us Linux-based environments that with very simple access through IBM Developer Works will allow an open source developer, a hobbyist, a student, with a few clicks to be able to get their own virtual machine that is running natively on a Z device hosted there. They'll be able to have a catalog of software, whether it's open source or IBM, build their environments, write code, bring their individual you know, development environment tools in, and sit and run on that for 90 days, um, try it, try the tires and see it, right? So some of the problems we've had in the past where folks just didn't have access to that sort of technology, we're fixing by putting this investment in there. Um, I frankly intend next year to create a similar environment for ZOS-related elements as well. So ZOS hobbyists, folks who might have retired but still want to play around, students who may want to have a go in that arena, that they can go through a simple click and access process to get a ZOS-based environment as well for them to, to play through as well. And that's a significant investment, but it's necessary to be able to draw developers in and build upon things like the academic initiative programs um, and stuff that we have done. We also became a partner, a founding member with others. CA is an example. SUSE is another example. Academic institutions, customers, have become members of the open mainframe project that the Linux Foundation runs. Investments being made there, a large donation of open source code that we have made. Our analytics software, the product Z-Aware, that uh, we first delivered for ZOS, and then earlier this year with Z13, we delivered that um, to also consume Linux logs and do IT analytics on the health of the system. That Linux element, we are pulling that out, and I've already stated we're donating that so it can actually be deployed on other platforms as well to get that cross-linkage of IT analytics. So big investments in that arena to help support and drive the attraction of what is, from a fundamental standpoint, you know, the most perfect platform for running enterprise Linux, enterprise applications, consolidations and integrations. We've been doing it for 15 years. When we made announcements at LinuxCon, did demonstrations of multiple elements of analytics running at the same time as doing Twitter searches and, and sentiment analysis and things like that, loaded up this machine um, and then showed how consistently, no matter how you load it, you get constant response time, the kind of classic things mainframers know about, it was blowing the minds of those folks who've never seen this system before. Then when you put the uh, sort of Perspex um, demonstration machine that we have sitting in our booth right behind here, and they start to see, actually see the hardware and the technology, I mean, then the geeks were really excited, which was, which was great to see. Um, so that there's a whole level of interest that we think is going to be quite different and attractive to the platform because it is solving problems that these guys are facing today in that environment. We also, as a part of our strategy, um, made a number of significant investments over the past 18 months around expanding and responding more rapidly to open source software technologies. We put a team in place that's per whose purpose is to go out under our direction and also request from customers and take open source software packages and bring them over and get them running on the platform, prove that that can be done, 
And we've also, in parallel with certain of these companies, got support relationships. So for the enterprise version of, of what they do, that they'll have um, support agreements available for enterprise customers. Let's say if you wanted to run MongoDB, Linux on, on the system. This team, um, they brought over about 50 or 50 odd packages to date. One thing that's really interesting, 90% of what they did, it was just a compile and test. They didn't have to change a line of code. That shows you Linux is Linux. You know, yeah, these some unique elements of drivers and things we contribute in the code, but Linux is Linux. You can bring it over, it will run. In the cases of where we had to make changes, which were all contributed back through the you know, regular processes to open source, we were making changes to those packages so they could exploit, very typically, the scope and the scale of what's going on. Database expansion, database growth, right? Uh, we've added Ubuntu because of its prevalence with a lot of developers as a distribution. So Red Hat, SUSE, which we've had for a long time, now Ubuntu added as well. Brought KVM as a hypervisor that is quite appealing to some of the small and newer clients. Also a useful way to be able to get skills from other platforms more readily versed in virtualization use on our platform. Did a lot of work with that. Then a host of languages, databases, uh, and, and things like that that we run there. We've been doing some fun things. Um, Mongo, uh, you know, a very fast growing, very popular database. We've built the largest Mongo disk that, database instance ever seen on the face of the planet. The Mongo guys couldn't believe how big a database we built because we're building it on a platform that is fundamentally designed to handle data and I.O. throughput in that way. Docker, we've been pushing Docker, um, using it in some of our demonstrations and really stretching the limits of the number of Docker containers you can create. I think the last number I'd seen is we'd put 200,000 Docker instances on one machine. And we're starting to play around now. We're trying to go up to a million. Now, are you really going to run a million on the platform? Maybe not. Depends on the size of what you want to put in the, in the container. But it does prove that the scalability and the scope of what we have from this platform eliminates some of these barriers and boundaries that call, cause folks to have to shard databases and, and move application instances elsewhere. That's the strength of the platform there. So a lot of investment, but, but rightfully so. And then with all of these capabilities and technologies and building upon classic performance boosts, COBOL compilers, JVM work, we're allowing uh, much improved development environments because what we don't want people to have to do is keep pulling assets and taking data, replicating storage, all the management associated with that, provide ways for folks to be able to access into the machine and do it more efficiently. And that's why we see a lot of Java growth related to the platform. When it comes to these individual instances, um, as we sort of close up on some of this function, the mobile access and even cloud-based access, if you've not been watching the space, we have done a great deal to simplify the access to these core assets that are there. There's the APIs of the past, connection methods into things like Kix and IMS and DB2. But we've brought out ZOS Connect. It's sort of a Rosetta Stone that understands all the APIs and connections into those core logic elements. But on the outside, it is interfaces, JSON connections, and things like that that are speaking the language of the mobile developer or the cloud service provider. Right? So if you've not taken a look at ZOS Connect, this is a great way for being able to really make and simplify some of those connections. There are clients who are using that to re-engineer and make much more efficient some of the connections that they've already forged. There are clients using it to provide services out to um, environments and other developers who have no idea the service they're using is actually benefiting from the topology of the mainframe. Right? So that's an important direction for us and all those connections so that the core assets, they can be leveraged. You don't have to create something new. In the case of analytics, um, we have brought in and expanded either with hardware accelerations, such as our single instruction multiple data or vector processing facility to accelerate mathematical accelerations of analytics, bringing in a variety of, uh, of analytic packages and technologies, Hadoop and, and Spark and those sorts of things. So you can build real-time transactional scoring, 
an insurance company working with us, has been using this technology, been using real-time transactional scoring to get much more precise analysis of a claim before they pay it to avoid paying fraudulent claims. They've gone back in history and looked at what it's going to mean to them. It's going to save them $200 million a year when they launch this in production scale by being able to do that real-time scoring inside the Z machine as the claims are being processed, as opposed to having to pull all their information out onto a different analytic farm and missing things by a few hours, right? It sounds, sounds small that period of time that matters in, in this economy in that speed. So there's a host of things that we have done there that's a whole two hour presentation in its own right. But if you're not really looking at some of the analytics things going on, it would be one suggestion I, I would strongly make. From a cloud perspective, um, we've been building clouds, true cloud services uh, with clients for a number of years. We've been using them internally on Z. We've been using them uh, with our clients. Um, but there's a huge thrust that we also have, again, in some of the standard and industry um, management methods, OpenStack being you know, a most common example. Another reason we went to KVM, because of the connections and the work that's going on there with, with OpenStack, makes sense for us to, to have in the platform. People have been using this services-based approach. You know, we talk about microservices. We talk about some of the containerizations. You've seen that in uh, some of the other presentations that have been going on in this conference. Some clients look at it and say, that's not anything new, right? Anyone who's been associated with a platform like this is used to seeing things like function calls, common functions that get called at various places. They're a form of, of containerizations and microservice. They're just being brought forward in a more modern environment to do that. One example on this chart, um, Walmart, who have talked about it publicly, they built a caching service, a very simple caching service, that's been exploited more and more because item file information, logistic information, was used in so many places throughout their, their, their structure, they were creating multiple caches having to manage them, having to deal with growth issues, access, performance, reliability. Someone stepped back and said, let's use the best platform on the face of the planet for being able to deliver data in response to whatever kind of claims are going on. They built a cache service out of the platform, made it available through an API that the mobile developers and distributed developers understand. It is five times cheaper than what they were doing with these distributed instances of CouchDB and Cassandra. Another simple example, there are examples of customers using security services. A security service they can access, they don't know. They're using hardware-based encryption on the platform to do it, right? So another good example of where is where we go and how we grow um, as we do it. And you can go public cloud, you can go private cloud, you can go hybrid, we play in all those things. I actually had a friend of mine, I have to say this, a friend of mine who is not a technologist, doesn't understand computers at all, he turned to me one day and he said, aren't you really worried being a computer developer working for a computer company? I said, why? I said, you know, technology is very important. He says, yeah, he said, but people are not gonna use, not gonna use any computers. No one will need a computer when they're able to use the cloud. I said, what the hell do you think the cloud is? He said, well, it's, it's this thing that, you know, people, I said, look, if you're not using your own computer, if you're using the cloud, you're using someone else's computer, but somewhere there's a computer involved. So there we go. I'm not worried. Uh, but we, you know, we satisfy, we work in all, these, in all these areas. And again, the real focus for us is making sure our connections and commonality with other platforms to be able to present these services in a very effective and efficient way, um, that, that's, uh, that that's, how, that's how things are done. So wrapping up. A lot of investment in technology. Hardware is fundamentally important to us. The differentiation of the architecture is fundamentally important, uh, has importance to us, not because we like developing these things, which we do, but because our clients are telling us how much they're gonna need this as we look at the workload parameters and changes going on. Systems, security, availability, the classics, we're investing heavily in all those to be able to do it. There is expanded investment and expanded focus. Don't confuse, by the way, IBM's many messages about Linux and open source, we talk about it a lot. Some clients have said, this means you're moving away from ZOS. Don't, don't confuse that at all. ZOS is absolutely the anchor point. If we don't have that, you're in a very different world, right? So we invest heavily there, but we're adding to it all the work we're doing in the open environment, open software, skills, and everything. 
So all that builds up to be able to support um, these workload trends and everything that we have going on. That's it, pretty much on time. Uh, I'm going to stick around for a few minutes if there's any questions. But if not, I really thank you. I hope there was something there you learned. Uh, and if not, send me an email and tell me to do a better job next time.